who doesn't love the idea of floating freely in the zero gravity environment of outer space? It looks like a ton of fun and people will happily pay Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson millions of dollars just to experience zero G for only a few minutes at a time. But if our goal is to live in outer space for the long haul, then the lack of gravity is going to be the biggest obstacle that we face. So in order to achieve a sustainable human presence in space, on the moon, or even on Mars, we need to solve the biggest logistical challenge of all, artificial gravity. This is the space race. Of course, whenever we say something like zero G, what we actually mean is microgravity because gravity is everywhere all the time. It's the force that holds the structure of the solar system and the galaxy together. Everything that has mass creates a gravitational effect, but it takes a very large concentration of mass like a planet to actually have a discernible effect with enough force that would make you stick to the ground. This is an oversimplification, but I know you don't come to this channel for a detailed physics lesson. So we have to also remember that the effect of gravity tapers off very quickly from the source. Gravitational waves continue on infinitely into the universe, but just like heat, gravity is only felt intensely when very close to the source. That's the easiest way to think about this. I'm not going to bother you with trying to explain the inverse square law today. Just imagine that you are sitting very close to a fireplace and you hold your hand out towards the flame. If you move that hand either backwards or forwards by a distance of just one foot, that could make the difference between warm, hot, or burning. The gradient of the heat is very extreme at this distance. But if you move back and are now six feet away from the fire and you hold your hand out again, you'll still feel the heat, but much less of it. And if you move your hand forwards or backwards by one foot, your perception of heat will be more or less the same in all positions. At this distance, the gradient of heat is much softer. This is all important, just stick with me and we'll get to the cool sci-fi stuff very shortly. The gravitational flame of the Earth is its core, which is a giant ball of solid metal that's surrounded by a thick outer layer of swirling liquid metal. An incredible amount of concentrated mass that creates a gravity well right in the middle of the planet, and that force radiates out to the surface of the Earth and even into space. Because the surface of the Earth is over 6,000 kilometers away from the center of the gravity well, we do not experience an extreme gradient in the force of gravity. Out here, the effect tapers off at a very shallow rate, so it doesn't matter if you are in an underground bunker or the top floor of the tallest building, your experience of gravity will be more or less the same, no perceivable difference. In fact, if you were to climb a ladder straight up into the sky, all the way to a height of 400 kilometers, which is the altitude of the International Space Station, you would still be experiencing 90% of the gravity that you left behind on the surface. And if you let go of that ladder, you would fall all the way back down. You might be confused at this point. Why do people in spaceships float at the same altitude that people on ladders fall down? Well, that's because an orbital spaceship or space station is in a constant state of freefall. This is what happens to the people in those Blue Origin capsules. They're not weightless because they are in space. They've just been launched straight up at a very high speed by a rocket engine. But then that engine cuts off and releases the capsule to coast up for a little while before it starts to fall back down again. While in freefall, the crew will float. Same thing happens in those airplanes that NASA has been using to train astronauts for decades. The difference between a Blue Origin capsule and a real spaceship like a Crew Dragon is that the Dragon has reached orbital velocity where it is moving so fast parallel to the Earth's surface that it is literally falling around the Earth. Here's the easiest way to think about this. If you throw a baseball, it will eventually curve downwards and hit the ground because gravity pulled it down. The faster you throw the baseball, the further it goes before its path eventually meets the ground. We can't stop gravity, but we know that the Earth's surface also curves down as it moves away from us. So imagine if you could throw a baseball so fast that the downward curve of the ball matched the curve of the Earth's surface. At this point, the ball would still be falling towards the ground, but the ground would be falling away from the ball at the same rate, so the ball would stay in the air. Of course, we know that even if you could throw a ball that fast, 
the resistance from the atmosphere would slow it back down again and it would still eventually hit the ground. But in space, once you reach that orbital velocity, there's pretty much nothing to slow you back down again, so you can continue to fall around the Earth, moving in a circular pattern of freefall, but never getting any closer to the surface. So all of that to say that gravity is extremely complicated, yet at the same time essential to our survival. The human body evolved under the force of Earth gravity. Our entire muscular and skeletal structure is designed to resist the force of gravity. All of our internal organs are meant to function in step with gravity. Food goes in the top, waste comes out the bottom. Our entire circulatory system is meant to keep our blood moving up and down in spite of the force of gravity. That means when you take gravity out of the equation, the entire body becomes a confused mess. It freaks out. Nothing is functioning the way it is supposed to. And if you stay in that state of anti-gravity for a prolonged period of time, then your body is going to have a very difficult struggle bringing you back to the natural equilibrium when you finally return to the Earth's surface. Coming back from weightlessness is like a full body hangover, except this one lasts for months. And if you stay weightless for too long, you may never get back to the way you were before. We're talking permanent damage. So with all of that in mind, we know that if humanity is ever to become a true spacefaring civilization and explore the outer reaches of the solar system and all of the planets and moons in between, or even if we just want to live in the orbit of our own planet, then we are going to need to sacrifice our own bodies or develop some kind of artificial gravity replacement. Because we know that the only way to create true gravity is with extreme concentrations of mass, the best we could possibly do with something as simple as a spaceship is to create a force that might simulate the effect of gravity. Luckily for us, Albert Einstein figured out how to do this a very long time ago. All we need to do is accelerate at a rate that is equivalent to the force of Earth's gravity, which in this case would be an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. This is also an oversimplification, but we've done just about enough bad physics lessons for one video. According to Einstein, if you could accelerate linearly at this exact rate, then the downward force you would experience from acceleration would be identical to the force of gravity experienced on the surface of the Earth. So why don't we do that? Well, accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared is incredibly rapid. It would take an outrageous amount of rocket fuel to achieve this kind of acceleration with a conventional rocket, and we have to remember that this is not a speed that you can coast at. This formula demands that you continuously accelerate at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared, which would pretty quickly get you up to a velocity that approaches the speed of light. You'd enter the next galaxy within a few years, you could probably even reach the edge of the known universe within your lifetime. Meanwhile, everything not moving at near light speed would experience billions of years of passing time, so the Earth, the Sun, and even the entire Milky Way galaxy would all have grown old and died. You'd have accelerated yourself right to the end of infinity, whatever that is. But time is even weirder than gravity, so let's stop talking about it before we all have an existential meltdown. So, with Einstein's theory out, that leaves us with one final way to mimic the effect of Earth's gravity, spinning in a circle. I'm pretty sure these things are illegal now, but if you're an adult over the age of 30, then you've probably experienced one of these playground merry-go-round things. A bunch of sadistic children would spin this nightmare up to terminal velocity until kids started flying off and vomiting everywhere. It was great fun, and that is the exact kind of effect that we are trying to replicate in space, just hopefully with less crying and vomiting. This is where rotating space stations come into the picture. We've seen a ton of these things in science fiction media over the years, but would they actually work as advertised in the real world? The reason that those old playground toys had such devastating effects on our tiny little bodies was down to the radius being too small and the rate of rotation being too fast for the brain and the inner ear to handle. Very smart people have done a bunch of really interesting studies where they stuck people into centrifuge machines, which are basically very large equivalents of our playground merry-go-round, and they monitor what happens to the lucky subjects. From that, we've figured out that the average person can sustain around one revolution per minute without becoming nauseous or disoriented, so that's not very fast. If we know the desired revolutions per minute and we know the target force of 1G, 
then all we need to do is find our radius for our circular space station and we should be all set. The biggest problem we face is that the slower the desired rotation, the larger the space station needs to be. For example, if we wanted to spin something the size of the existing ISS to generate 1g of force, then it would need to rotate once every 10 seconds, so obviously the result would be a vomit comet. It's generally accepted that to achieve a force of around 1g at around 1 RPM, we would need a structure that is at least 1 kilometer across, so this is one gigantic circle. But that's not even all that we have to consider here. Remember, we figured out that the Earth's surface is over 6,000 kilometers away from its gravity well, and that's why we don't experience different amounts of gravity at different elevations on the surface. Even in a one kilometer diameter ring, you are now relatively close to your center point, which in that case, the center of the ring would be a point of zero gravity and the full 1g force would be located on the outside of the ring. That means that the gradient between 0g and 1g is going to be pretty steep, so just standing up straight on the floor, you may experience a perceptible difference in the force of gravity acting on your head than what you feel at your feet. Best case scenario, this could be very strange, but worst case, it could be straight up disorienting. This is also problematic if you want to have multiple levels in your space station, as each level would have a reduced force of gravity as you went up, and even more extreme gradient between the force of gravity at the ceiling and g-force at the floor, though climbing any kind of stairs or ladder would be nearly impossible. Yet another force that we have to consider here is the Coriolis effect, which is pretty much the effect of our rotational momentum on objects inside the station. We have this on the Earth, but because the Earth rotates so slowly, the Coriolis effect is imperceptible in our daily lives. The force of gravity significantly overpowers the rotational momentum, so it only really has an effect on high-level weather patterns. This is what causes storm clouds and hurricanes to rotate, but on a much smaller, much faster spinning station, the Coriolis effect is going to be a regular force to contend with. It basically means that nothing will ever go in a straight line. So if you tried to throw a baseball inside a rotating space station, the ball would immediately curve over to the side. If you tried to pour a drink into a glass, the liquid would go flying out at an angle. Trying to take a shower would be a major challenge because the water would never fall straight down. Now, you've probably already noticed that building a gigantic space station ring one kilometer across is going to be nearly impossible from a logistical standpoint. That's the kind of thing that will definitely require some asteroid mining and a whole manufacturing industry on the moon and stuff like that. But we could have a more feasible solution. We don't actually need the entire ring. All we need is the diameter and the rotation. So you could have two space station modules that are connected together by a one kilometer long truss and then set it into rotation. This would achieve that force of roughly 1g in each of the modules. So in theory, all we would really need to figure out is a relatively basic microgravity 3D printing operation to build out that truss structure. We could then use two large vehicles like SpaceX Starships or Sierra Space Inflatable Life Modules, and we could have the first artificial gravity station. This is at least conceivable with the technology that we have available right now. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.